Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. The gold standard of journalism is the Associated Press, and in every corner of the planet there's life. This international news cooperative is wired and wiring us. If you could download one free app, dare I say, the AP's is the most complete source of news. On today's show, we're lucky to have Gary Pruitt, the AP's CEO and president, and the former chief of the McClatchy newspaper company, According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, 61 reporters were killed last year in the line of duty, including four of the AP's own. And to combat the increased violence, Pruitt has suggested that the Con Geneva Convention take on new meaning, to make the killing of a journalist a war crime. He said, it used to be that when media wore press emblazoned on their vehicle or vest, it gave them a degree of protection. But that labeling now is more likely to make them a target. He said this in a speech at the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondence Club. And there are three particular subjects I'm hoping to explore with Gary today. First, this very topic of a new war on journalism and journalists. How do we protect reporters in regions like Nigeria and Yemen? Second, the business model of the AP that has survived amid a shift to online social aggregation. How can we learn from the Associated Press and its valuation of journalism? And finally, and maybe most significant, the public's right to know. Why is the AP leading an effort to force a release of Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Clinton's emails? And Gary, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm delighted to be here, Alexander. Thank you. It's, it's really an honor for us. Let's start backwards with that third question. Why the suit? The AP um, files thousands of freedom, of freedom of information requests to the U.S. government every year. Often we learn valuable information and, and report stories. Occasionally we're, de we're denied access. And then sometimes we're just stalled and stiff-armed completely. And that's what happened with the Department of State. We had some requests that were pending for five years and we, weren't, we were not getting any responses. They dealt with Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State, but they were broad-based searches well before the current controversy related to her private email server. And uh, we were not getting a response from the, Secretary of, from the State Department. Ultimately, we felt we had no choice but to go to federal court in Washington and sue for access. It's not something we do lightly, but we do it occasionally when we feel we are being roadblocked on getting information that's important and public. Your argument fundamentally is that the public has a right to Secretary of State Clinton's emails. The public does. It's clear in the law that the public has a right to emails that don't create national security risks or other or, or privacy invasions, but the, why, the great swath of information requested um, is the public has a right to know, and we need to know how our public servants are serving the public need. Secretary of Clinton has said that it's incumbent upon the elected official or the senior level person in government to put forward the emails that they find relevant to the public's knowledge, the work of the people, that is. And in many states, uh, the onus is on 
the government officials because there aren't laws that mandate the federal scrutiny that, that has been established now. Mm -hmm. Are you going to wage a campaign from State House to the executive branch to ensure that here in New York, for example, when Governor Cuomo enforced a uh, automatically deleted email policy, that what applies to Secretary Clinton applies to every governor? Well, AP does do a survey of 50 states in what we call Sunshine Week every year, evaluating all the states and their work. And, um, and what we have found most recently uh, is a disturbing trend by the states where they are in effect getting around public access laws by charging so much for their time or copies that it's tantamount to denying access. Charging thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for records that they even acknowledge are public but would be expensive to produce and that in effect shuts down the access of the public. So there are various ways of getting around it and AP likes to keep the spotlight on the public officials and the laws that uh, so as to act as a surrogate for the people um, so that we can get this public knowledge. The fact that Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and the fact that she operated her server privately, mm -hmm. those factors complicate it presumably in a way that a situation with a governor of a state would not. So I, I don't take issue at all with your grievance that these records ought to be public and that she should not have operated that account out of her Westchester home. But the one thing I'm, I want you to consider, and, and I'm curious, is imagine a scenario, and this goes to another point that I hope we discuss later on, in which an AP reporter's life is in jeopardy. The national security risk is there and your diplomatic channels have to be secret. And the negotiation that leads you to free um, a, an imprisoned photographer, reporter, source on the ground, those channels, in order to protect lives for a year, for two years, for five years moving forward, they have to remain private, secret, classified. So will you be more effective winning this, this suit? If you stipulate that, per the National Records Administration, these emails, like the emails of a president, imagine FDR, JFK, mm -hmm. FDR fighting World War II, JFK during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, um, and imagine the immediate necessity to release the telegraphs, the correspondence with Churchill, are you going to win this argument if you, if you acknowledge that there is historical perspective in that Secretary of State Clinton's emails, all of them should be released, but not immediately? Well, <clears throat> the law covers this. And so AP is not in the business of endangering people's lives or national security. So that certainly is a valid exception to hold back emails and records. There's no doubt about that. The law makes that clear. But the records requested are clearly within the Freedom of Information Act and public records that the public has a right to know, um, especially as evaluating a potential presidential candidate, that this value is great. It will be valuable to historians decades later, no doubt, as well. But it's important also for uh, voters in making a decision and evaluating candidates now. And we're not asking for records that would endanger people's lives or endanger national security, but merely the, uh, the, the, the pursuit of her job mm -hmm. and the records that um, the public has a right to know. We have not even heard from the State Department saying, here's what we think, these records are public, these records are private. In some cases, five years, nothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is an untenable situation and a flat denial of the public's right to know. That's why we challenged. And would you say an extension of the endangerment, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, would be the Iranian nuclear negotiation or the detente with Cuba or the cooling of relations emails that would, would show that these relationships are being built under uh, circumstances of trust 
is that a is that a balance too? Absolutely. I mean, look, there. The as I said, this is uh, this involves sorting out which records uh, are public or not, and they redact a lot of documents, and so we get documents that are blacked out, and we understand there are certain requirements for secrecy and and sensitive international relations. We're not even getting to that level. Right. We're not even getting to that position. We're, we're just being stalled outright. And what about those who break the rules? The, the, I mean, they break the law in pursuit of what they think is a higher moral ground. WikiLeaks, for example. AP doesn't take editorial positions, so it's not as if we've opined on uh, what we think of Edward Snowden or WikiLeaks or any other um, uh, case like that. Um, the AP is in favor broadly of the public right to know and free expression and free press rights, but um, we have not expressed opinions on WikiLeaks or um, really any other editorial matter for that sake. Well, you may not express opinions, but, but because you abide by the letter of the law in pursuit of journalistic freedom, it's a, it's a way that you differentiate your organization from others that, are, that may have similar goals. Yes, I mean, uh, everyone has to uh, make their own decisions, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, the Associated Press is a worldwide news organization and um, we, uh, we abide by the law, we challenge laws when we feel they have, uh, uh, when they're impinging on the free press rights. When the Justice Department took our phone records secretly in 2013, we challenged the Justice Department, feeling that their actions didn't even, you know, didn't comply with their own rules and were so far overreaching as to be unconstitutional. We engaged with the Justice Department, to their credit, they changed the rules so that journalists now have greater protections when the federal government is seeking records. So, uh, yeah, the AP is always active in this area, always active in working to improve the laws so that uh, free expression and free press rights in the United States and worldwide can be fully exercised. So you, though, have made a strong statement in condemning the violence against journalists, uh, and, and that's a position that the global community shares largely. Uh, but in deeming uh, violence or the murder of journalists a war crime, you think, Gary, that it will establish a protection that's been lost? I think so. I mean, there are two... Uh two trends going on here. One is that more and more journalists are being killed. And if you look over uh, a multi-decade history, you can see that in the past 20 years, the numbers have exploded. You mentioned 61 journalists killed last year. Over 1,000 have been killed um, since the early 90s. And the numbers are growing. And uh, we see it at AP, too. And, and to what do you attribute that increase? I think there are a few things going on. I mean, there are many conflict zones. Also, uh, it used to be that the press did have a degree of freedom when they had press emblazoned on their vest or on their vehicle, but it is more likely to make them a target now. Extremist groups don't need media to tell their story anymore. They can go directly to the public through social media and other technology. So the, the press, can be seen as an impediment or a critical filter for their story. And uh, so they don't need them. Secondly, kidnapping and holding uh, journalists for ransom is a business model now for many groups. And then finally, and most perniciously, killing a journalist um, isn't necessarily to stop a news story, but to create a news story, almost a, a bloody press release. And so, <clears throat> we see all these factors and uh, a violent world, huge, num huge increase in the number of journalists killed. You mentioned AP lost four journalists last year, three in conflict zones. One assassinated by a police commander in Afghanistan charged with protecting her. And two in Gaza when an un unexploded missile went off. So even when you do everything right, there are circumstances that can go wrong. We understand that. But what's going on at the same time that journalists face more and more danger 
is uh, the, there's a breakdown of prosecution of the, the killers, of the murderers. In fewer than 10% of the cases of journalists being killed, is there any investigation whatsoever? The investigation and prosecution is left to the nation state, to the countries that are often in disarray and can't handle it and don't pursue it. In fewer than 5% of the cases, is there ever a prosecution or a conviction? So at the same time more journalists are being killed, fewer and fewer investigations and prosecutions are being brought. The system has broken down. So I think what we need to do is elevate the system beyond the country level to the International Criminal Court, to an international body. Now, I'm not naive. I do understand that uh, the Islamic State group will, is flaunting international law currently, and this will not uh, probably change their behavior. But I do think it will influence others uh, in other areas at other times, and especially over time. And I think also it will help with future prosecutions because it will give another, um, another path for prosecutions because it is the impunity of the killers that empowers them and emboldens them. And uh, that's dangerous. Now that's dangerous for journalists and we can all feel sorry for journalists, but it's broader than that because the journalists are the eyewitnesses to history and are there reporting in some of the dangerous, most dangerous places in the world and some of the most important stories in the world. And they're telling the story to the rest of the world so we can understand it, so we can understand what the situation is. We need them there. If it's so dangerous that they can't be there, then we lose that picture, that window of that story, and the world is poorer. So we need to offer greater protection by making it a war crime if journalists are killed. It won't solve all the problems. There will still be major issues, but I think it will help, and I think it will help over time. It's a step that we can take by uh, changing Geneva Accords or increasing the, uh, an, another treaty or adding it to the international criminal courts. I think those steps would be helpful uh, for journalists and for all of us in the world over time. From your bureaus across the, the country and mm -hmm. correspondence, in situations where um, a particular photographer or reporter um, was either kidnapped or, or murdered, in, in your contact with the kinds of groups that don't res would not respect the authority mm -hmm. of an, um, a Geneva Convention for journalists, is there any takeaway what they want? The first AP journalist killed covering the news died at the Battle of Little Bighorn covering Custer in 1876. Mm -hmm. He said, I go with Custer, and he did. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had uh, 35 journalists killed covering the news for last year. And the numbers have increased in recent years. Fortunately, we don't have anyone being held currently, um, but Terry Anderson was a prominent AP reporter who was held, not for uh, ransom, but ultimately released. And uh, I would say the circumstances are very different depending on the conflict, depending on the situation, depending upon the, the people involved. Last year, uh, we had a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer covering the Afghan election. And as I said, a police commander charged with protecting her convoy turned his gun on her at point blank range, threw it down on the ground and said, Allah Akbar, God is great. Well, God may be great, but you've just killed one of the world's greatest photographers. And um, that person turned himself in and was prosecuted. Um, there was no protection against that when a security person turns. Uh, when an unexploded missile went off in Gaza and killed two of our staffers and blew off the leg of a photographer, there was nothing that could be done there. AP never sends anyone in to a conflict zone unless he or she volunteers, that they've had hostile environment training, they have the best equipment, protective equipment, communications equipment, they've, they've experience, they have experience in covering conflicts or they're part of an experienced team. And of course they have a big news organization standing behind them. But even then, problems, problems occur. 
One of the things that I think all media can do is uh, agree on principles, common principles that they of how they will protect their journalists and treat their journalists if they're taken hostage, whether they are an employee or an independent contractor, because there are more and more freelancers out there. And we don't want any media organization to take the position that, well, if a freelancer gets kidnapped, you know, that's his problem or her problem. Are uh, there common rules? By which there are news common guidelines apply. that have uh, that many news organizations, including the AP, have come together and uh, signed and supported just earlier this year, and we want all media organizations to agree to them and abide by them because we think that's what media organizations can do to protect journalists, and then we think. Uh, adding it as a war crime can help over time. Mm -hmm. A united and, front. Yes, basically that's right. And how does that united front interact with the State Department, which in, in some instances may want to act in opposition to the way that you want to potentially free a reporter or correct a, something that's gone terribly wrong? Right. Well, the U.S. State Department does recognize that this is a major problem, the safety of journalists and killing. I mean, it's, it's become so dangerous that there are very few journalists now covering the Syrian civil war. We used to have reporters uh, in rebel-held territory and in Damascus. And it's become so dangerous it's uh, difficult to have any journalists there. Um, the U.S. State Department understands that this is a major issue. But, uh, and, we've, and they've asked for our input in this area, and we've provided it. Mm -hmm. But um, nothing really beyond that. I think this very much ties into the valuation or monetization of news, which was the third topic that I was hoping to explore. And that is, the AP is indispensable, and I think even this next generation is beginning to see in the local papers that are still thriving, that subscribe to the wire service, that you have eyes and ears around the world. I just want to ask you plain and simple, how can you afford to have a free app? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, the AP is a different breed of cat. <clears throat> so it's important to think about that uh, the AP has been around since 1846. It was founded by five New York newspapers who wanted to find a more efficient way to cover the Mexican-American War. So they all got together and hired a reporter to go to the western deserts to cover that war. AP uh, still exists. It's the largest news organization in the world now. Those five New York newspapers are long gone. It's an improbable story. And it happened, I think, because AP is different than other news organizations. We've been solely focused on news from our beginning, never anything else. It's our true north, undiluted. We strive to be objective. We take no editorial stance. We never endorse candidates. We, we want to be objective as we possibly can. It was AP's reporter in the Civil War that introduced the idea and the ideal of objectivity in reporting. We're a nonprofit. We don't have owners. We're a nonprofit news organization. And we don't have the same market pressures. We have to be viable. I asked but, Bill Keller at mm -hmm. the same table if he thought that it was essential for these emerging media outlets to be nonprofits. And he was mum. But I'll, I want to ask you the same question in order to, yeah. to succeed well, as I a think, model. I think what Bill Keller was probably talking about were foundation-funded news organizations. AP is not that. AP is a business. We have to be viable, but we don't have owners. Right. And so what we are, we have a structure where we are what business people call B2B, business to business. We take our content and license it to other media, television stations, TV stations, uh, newspapers, and digital companies. And we do not go directly to consumers except with our app, which is a, a limited uh, but still very good app and, um, and highly rated. I appreciate the plug you gave us. But um, most of our revenue comes from other media subscribing to AP content and using it. AP is producing over 2,000 text stories every day three to four thousand photos every day and hundred and fifty video news stories every day going out around the world and uh, with uh, and through other media reaching over half the world's population every day no media organization in the world perhaps no entity in the world has a bigger reach than the Associated Press every day we're not the most glamorous we don't have the 
Vanity Fair, or we don't have the Academy Award parties. Uh, we're not the most well known because we're behind the scenes with B2B. We're not the most profitable. We're a nonprofit. But I think in terms of reach, you could argue, and, and being everywhere, that we are the most important news organization in the world. At least I'd like to think that. Mark Twain in 1907 said there are only two forces that bring light to the all corners of the globe, the sun in the heavens and the Associated Press down here. And that was 1907. Our reach is far greater now. Um, in over 100 countries, where we have um, bureaus in Havana, in Tehran, in Pyongyang, North Korea. Only AP The is, only one. The only one. Only AP is in all those places. And I think your pitch to consumers as we wrap up here is important to get them to realize that they are the quiet treasure in the fourth estate. It's the reason we do it all. When I became president of AP, I said, our mission is to inform the world so young people today growing up get a chance to go to school, get a chance to fall in love, and get a chance to be cool. Borrowing from Neil Young's Rockin' in a Free World. But there can be no higher calling. Gary Pruitt, CEO and president of the Associated Press, thanks so much for joining me on The Open Mind today. Thank you, Alexander. I appreciate it. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other Open Mind interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the Corporate Community, Mutual of America.